Hi, Alex. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, I forgot to ask you, what time is it there? Because like, we were on a call a few hours ago and you're in Australia. What time is it there now? Well, I've had the privilege of not only having my day start with you, it's also <laughs> with you as well. So it's definitely a win-win day. So it started bright and early this morning with the sun rising at 7 a.m. here in uh, Sydney or Northern Beaches of Sydney and uh, has long since gone down and it's quarter past 10 now right and evening and i get to see my evening out uh, having a conversation with you which is cool but with that said please bear in mind that it is uh, late in the eve if i'm uh, slightly slower the cogs the clogs turn slightly slower than usual <laughs> I'm sure you'll be absolutely wonderful as always, but thank you so much. Um, I know you've had a long day. That's, you know, it's really cool that you've come on. Um, I wanted to, to get you on actually. Um, I started this a few months ago, this podcast, and I, I've always had you in my mind. So, because um, we met early 2018 and um, I attended a, a program that you were delivering at the time, Brand Incubator, which was all about, um, discovering our purpose and our vision and our mission and core values and all that sort of thing um which was uh, amazing and um you know thoroughly enjoyed that whole time with you and um got to meet your mom as well which was wonderful because she was on the same the same program um yeah that was one of my favorites that was the that was a one-off occasion when my mom came and sat in and she ended up being a big part of the experience so you picked a good one I know, yeah, because I was desperately trying to get on the one before because um, a couple of people I got friendly with were on that one and I couldn't get on. It was too full. So it was uh, destiny, wasn't it, in terms of the one that I did get on. Um, so, yeah, so, so, and I know, you know, some of your story and I know, you know, you, you've had different, um, well, you've done lots of different things. So I just, and you're very inspirational. So I just thought it would be wonderful to get you on for you to share some of your story um, and you know as the, the the title of this podcast suggests it's about not settling for second best and you know just in the small time I've known you that's abundantly apparent <laughs> so I would just love you to um, for you know for the listeners and for the viewers share share a little bit about you if that's okay Sure. I mean, first and foremost, it's probably good to check how long you intend this podcast. To be. <laughs> <laughs> a fifteen-minute or thirty-minute podcast, then I can soon run that clock down at a terrible pace. And um, so, I'll try as precise as I can be and try not to go down too many rabbit holes. Um, but before I do, it is probably genuinely worth checking how long you. Hope yeah, yeah. To um, they're, they've sort of varied between about thirty-five to sixty minutes. So. Any, anything in between. Awesome. I'll definitely try and be concise. Um, I'd also like to remark at this um, juncture, it's great to be here. It's been awesome to watch your trajectory, if that's not too patronizing, um, from that moment at the brand incubator. See how you came in, just to add a little more context. Um, we held a sort of three day workshop together people are coming in entrepreneurs individuals that are looking to build their um, businesses and bra their brands many startups and solopreneurs and um, we kind of took them through a process of understanding how to build those upon fundamentals um, that would sustain those businesses and the individuals within them um, across time to not only succeed with the, the goal and vision of that business also in a way that will be at integrity of the individual, how they feel, um, their alignment to their values, their vision, their mission, their purpose. So their businesses became a vehicle that helped them to bring their purpose into life. So basically they could enjoy it, <laughs> enjoy running your business, feel good about it, feel inspired. Um, it also just happens to be the best way to actually make it work, which is handy. Um, and it's kind of surprisingly a very in-depth personal discovery journey to find out what those uh, core fundamentals to build yourself and your business are. So we kind of hoodwink the individuals um, who come to the <laughs> workshop or surprise them is probably a kind of way of putting it, yeah. <laughs> into coming in to build um, a powerful sort of brand for their business and ended up going deep into their own 
lives and asking fundamental questions that um, are so important to ask or so difficult to ask and especially um, when you're trying to do it by yourself without reflection so um, I watched you throw yourself into that process head sort of two feet first um, massive heart I know straight away just how big a heart courage I know you move through some stuff to step out and step into yourself and what I've seen is basically just a continued journey of that and, and you continuing to take yourself on, be honest about your experience and where you're being challenged by it and where you're not letting those challenges stop you or slow you down despite them and aiming at truth and aiming at stepping into your purpose and choosing to believe that life is beautiful and meaningful and worth taking on and worth struggling through those times of chaos and unknown and to choose to reevaluate your past and to forgive yourself of the stories and to allow yourself to be present and step into who you can be now and who you choose to be moving forward. And um, you've inspired me, so it was really nice for you to share that I've had some um, part in that journey. And uh, we could go down into sort of many details in terms of what led me to that point or to this point, but I guess if the title is not settling for second best, um, that's kind of always been a part of my nature. <laughs> I grew up I grew up with um, uh, an older cousin and a sister, an older sister who I love both dearly, and we were competitive about everything. And I was youngest, so everything was a game. Everything, you, it was high stakes, of course. <laughs> and um, whether we were playing in the garden, computer games, football, whatever it might be, bike rides, everything got turned into a competition. So that certainly ignited a competitor in me. Um, and then I guess so I never was happy with second best to the point of where I had to teach myself to be a slightly uh, more graceful loser at certain um, points in my adult life. Um, <clears throat> I think it was what I wouldn't settle for being second best in, which had the biggest change or impact on my life. Um, and that is when I went through, I guess, for want of a better word, my awakening or time of sort of coming into um, so much chaos that all of the stories and uh, narratives about who I am, what my life is, and what life's going to look like and going to be sort of just came cram uh, crumbling down. And that was when I lost my father and sister, both to cancer within a year of my mother. And Vicky, my sister, was 29. Um, and my father, um, I was 26 at the time. And it was just one of those times where you just get hit from every direction. Um, you kind of make peace with you know, your dad passing, but Vicky and I were extraordinarily close. Um, it's just one of the, it's like when your first, your worst fear sort of manifests, basically. That's what it's like. So that was a major inflection point in my trajectory, I guess, as a human being, as much as anything else. Um, and I moved through that time from a place of being sort of fully collapsed and in a place of, um, sort of giving up, laying in bed sort of listlessly um, for maybe a couple of weeks, I'd say three or four weeks um, after Vix had passed away. But we decided to keep a promise to her that she made in the hospital to um, go on to support young people that are going through the same thing she was going through. And that was kind of a flare of hope. And we started a charity, myself, my mum, and um, my brother-in-law, CJ, uh, called Victoria's Promise, of which we now support other young women that are going through the same thing. But within the context of what we're talking here about second best, from that moment, I knew that every day that I had was a day that she wasn't here and that she wasn't getting. And for the first sort of three, four years, I was just sort of, just trying to f survive, I guess, for want of a better phrase. But by the time I hit 30 and I was about to take over her, when my 30th birthday, that was the, the day that I became a year older than she was. 
And by this point, I understood um, my values, my vision for, for who and what I wanted to be and what I wanted to achieve in my life based on those values. I understood my purpose. And I understood that these were the things that could not be taken away from me, despite no matter what happens in my exterior environment. These were things that couldn't take me away from me could not be taken away from me. And not only that, these were the things that when I adhered to and stayed aligned to, brought me into harmony, into a place where I felt like I was coming out of the dark and into the light, basically, is from one of a better way of describing it. Out from the, the pure darkness that I was in, utilizing, using this framework and this understanding of my values, my vision, my mission, my purpose, and responding to life, at integrity with those things led me on a path out of that through to a path of peace of coming into terms with those those things and then seeing the extraordinary and feeling and coming to understand the extraordinary gifts in those things and then on my 30th birthday knowing that every single day was a day that she wouldn't live and therefore i would live them to their max now that doesn't mean that every day I live like Christmas day. What that means is that I try and be as true to myself as I can be in that day and respond to life in, in as much truth as I can. And that isn't, that doesn't always happen <laughs> by any sense of the imagination, but I have the tools and understand to see when I fall short of those things. Um, but I fear I could, you know, this story, the last time you heard this story was a three and a half hour presentation. <laughs> that was the, condensed version. So I guess I'm going to just pause there and um, give you an opportunity to redirect or interject or ask any questions. Um, yeah, so I mean, I do know, um, you know, the story about your sister and, and um, the, the charity and I've been, you know, I went to that beautiful ball that you had um, and jumped out of a plane for Victoria's Promise. That was last year. Um, and, you know, it, it's incredible, you know, you, you took a tragic situation and turned it into something so positive for so many people. A lot of people just wouldn't even have that within them to do, you know? Um, so it, it's so inspirational for me. And I, I wanted to be a part of that. And I wanted to, you know, just feel part of that. So I'm scared to death of heights, but I still jumped out of a plane because I wanted to, you know, contribute in some way. I think especially meeting your mum helped, you know, that build that because she's such a wonderful human being and, and well, as you both are. So, um, so I think um, what, what I'd also think our listeners would be interested in is because you, you, you're a very driven person, but you, you, you've become more spiritual over the last few years. I think that's fair to say the last couple of years is that fair to say um because when i met you you're very um you're very well read you're very language is your thing um more scientific and i used to i used to be i used to be a bit confused with you in those sessions because i'd be like i'd be like well he seems really spiritual but he's talking science and because i'm very more right brained than left and you know and all that sort of stuff it used to confuse me but then i've seen you know, a, a difference and a change in, in how you're expressing yourself, um, certainly in the last few months. Um, so that, I think that would be uh, quite nice to touch on in terms of how that sort of come about. But also, you know, you were a semi-professional footballer. You, you also had your own business, which was bringing you a lot of money and it was all about fast cars and, and all that sort of thing. So I think it would be nice just to take a little meander through your journey for the listeners. Um, just to see how you've evolved. And, and, and I know the chaos of, Vi of Vicky and your dad catapulted some of that, but just, to, just for them to understand where you came from and where you are, I think. Sure. Um, <clears throat> so I guess, yeah, I was, like I say, competitive. Um, I wanted to do well, I wanted to, I wanted to play the game, do you know what I mean? I came up, I was you know, athletic. Um, by the time I was in my early 20s, I was, um, you know, I was aiming at being as wealthy as I could be by do doing as little work as I possibly could. <laughs> um, basically, I wanted to, 
I remember my dream being being able to just sit basically in my pants all day uh, watching daytime TV and just having completely passive income. <laughs> so by day I wanted to basically just play football, have a passive income and try and find the most attractive girlfriend that I could possibly find and uh, have the most well-defined six pack that I could possibly sculpt. And I did pretty well, to be honest, on all those fronts, all of those fronts. You know, I, I was in my early 20s, I drove a, you know, a nice sort of sports car, ATT, I had lovely, um, beautiful girlfriends, and they're all sweethearts, all of them. Um, and I had, uh, you know, a business that I did like a couple of weekends, you know, a weekend, very little work, basically, essentially, in the passive income. And I was playing semi-professional football. So on the surface, everything was exactly as it, you know, I, I was doing, I was doing all the things. You know, it was like my vision board had sort of come off the page, right? And it was there, but it didn't feel good. I felt like, um, I know it's a sort of a cliche story, but it's because it's the truth, really. Um, I was all sort of on the verge of, you know, feeling embarrassed. Um, like sort of like I was afraid of feeling embarrassed. I was like very confident outwardly, very slick, fast witted, confident outwardly, you know, always, you know, hold court, et cetera. But inwardly I was nervous and I was anxious and um, I was just searching for something to, to feel really, only I think. I wanted to just feel, and what would happen is I'd get, I'd have relationships with um, girlfriends, and what I can still to look back on is I, I was trying to validate myself, not through actual just sleeping with women, but actually having them fall in love with me, I, that's what I needed the validation on. So, and this was unconscious to me. So I was getting into uh, relationships, and then being as charming as I could be, Again, not consciously, just because this is what I wanted. I wanted this relationship to work. And then about three months in, there's something I'd feel they would be expressive about where they're at in terms of their like depth of feeling of love that was in them. And I would just feel something switch off. And then I'd just feel terrible, basically, um, about being sort of caught in this place where I didn't want to hurt this person's feelings, but like literally feeling nothing because I wasn't being validated. Because the love, the validation that I was looking for had happened, now I needed it to happen again. So then that was in my early 20s. So then I went through this, uh, this breakdown into chaos. Um, for when my dad and my sister got sick, I lost my um, footballing career. I had to have my third knee ligament operation. Um, I lost my uh, business. I had a business at the time, another business called Fit Pro Digital that went down because I couldn't, you know, I just couldn't be. I couldn't be bothered basically with anything. I didn't care then. So I, you know, went through this just collapse of everything into chaos. And from that point, I just decided when I, like, I was so empty and hollow. And then, because Vicky was just the, like, she was the one thing I knew I could feel, like, how much love I felt there. Do you know what I mean? So, once I went through that and I went that journey from that point of coming to peace, um, I did, you know, I followed the path many have followed of trying to understand Eastern philosophy. I was very well versed in sciences. I enjoy them. I still think they're marvelous. Um, Richard Dawkins was one of my favorite writers. He was a brilliant in many ways. Um, enjoyed yeah, I enjoyed learning, you know, thirst for learning and understanding. Um, uh, but I could feel and, and where I was, the pain I was in and the disconnection I was in, I looked around me and I knew the only place that would possibly hold any answers for me would be East, Eastern philosophies. I knew that I had to go to Southeast Asia. I knew that I had to be there and to go and try and understand start to begin to understand some more in depth about some of the philosophies in that part of the world. How did you know that? Was that just an inner thing? <sighs> I think I was starting to broaden my horizons. I decided at this point that 
I'm just going to be honest about what I believe and where I'm at because I don't know what's true and what's not because what I thought to be true is no longer true. So I'm just going to let go and just be honest with where I am and what I believe, no matter what that means. And I think I read The Power of Now. I read The Untethered Soul. And but honestly, it's intuitive that led me to those books. How, how does any book? It speaks to you, I guess. It looks at you when you're in the space where you need it. And I, I mean, I had some understanding of, of like the ideas of the East and uh, there'd always been an interest. Um, I knew I wanted to go and really understand and understand uh, Buddhism and spend some time, and, you know, with some novice monks, just like a week, not, not anything over intense, but just trying to get a feel for energy, the way they are, meditation, those things. And that was uh, early. And then I just continued to sort of what, was, what those steps, combining what I was teaching and learning about your values, your vision for your life and um, a mission for that and how the impactful that is when it's genuinely built on something intrinsic within you and, and that genuinely you are trying to align to it. Genuinely trying to bring a purpose into my life and follow those tenets, walking that path of trying to come into my own peace and understanding and finding myself essentially on a path of self-realization as a result of those things. Beginning to notice that what was being most impactful in my life was that through following these measures, I was bringing more and more awareness into my experience, more and more awareness into my own experience, more and more awareness, therefore, of the experience, because our own experience is the experience, our experience is the experience. So, inadvertently found myself on a path of self-realization and um, came into contact with chaos uh, another couple of times. A girlfriend unexpectedly left me. Um, by this point, I had surrendered to that being what, what, what it is, what was, but still had to feel all the feelings and all the things. And followed that journey, continued, and by this point had just come to a point of surrender like full surrender. So surrendering the future, I guess, is one way of saying it. Having a vision for what I want to feel in the future, but surrendering to the present moment and being present to what is and giving my awareness to the genuine space around me and my thoughts, heart, as much as I possibly could. And um, allowing myself to move intuitively through my experience. Do you want to do this? What does that feel like, yes or no? And then just going with that and being with that. And that led me on a journey at, um, I guess it led me on a journey to Bali. Um, along, I was, you know, with some work, doing some work out there. I was doing some work in Australia, doing a talk, and then I was doing a talk, a mastermind in Bali. And I was in Bali, and I decided to take some extra time um, at the end of my um, experience um, of the work and just hang out in Bali. It was coming to the end of the sort of five years since I had lost Victoria, um, and. You know, by this point, I was, I was coming into a very centered place with everything and sort of a level of peace. Although what I thought was peace then, well, compared to where I'm at now, it, it certainly was not, but I just didn't, hadn't uncovered the next layer of non-peace, if that makes sense, which is sure what I'll feel in another, you know, few years from what I'm in right now. Isn't it? However, um, so I decided to finish off that year by just being in, in Bali and seeing where that led me and just kind of like closing off this chapter of um, breaking up with my ex-girlfriend and the um, losses that I'd experienced. Um, from there, I basically, through following that same, those same tenants, found myself um, on the waiting list for a uh, plant medicine ceremony. I'd never... Um, worked with anything that would be described as a psychedelic in my life. Uh, by this point, I'd read a lot and researched in terms of just interest in um, the healing abilities of the psychedelics from a sort of Western scientific perspective. But then also the tribal and ritual um, perspectives of how the, they've been working more sort of holistically, I guess, with these plants and, and with ritual and ceremony as well. Um, for time immemorial and just getting more of a genuine but sort of never really feeling drawn to myself because 
oh, I'm really scared of losing my mind. I feel like it's pretty much on the edge anyway. And uh, feeling like <laughs> I'm probably just like one droplet away from being fully crazy. So I probably don't want to mess too heavily with anything that's psychedelic. So never want to experiment with those kind of things, kind of growing up or anything like that. So I heard I'd certain, you know, I'd read and come to an appreciation of these things. But anyway, it then appeared on a play in front of me. And I was in this space of just saying, not just saying yes to everything, but being true to what was intuitively drawing me towards something. Um, and I basically got into a conversation um, and ended up on a, finding out that there was no spaces, but there was a waiting list. So I got on the waiting list. As I said, well, that's great, because then if I'm going to be there, I'll be there. If I'm not, I'm not. Anyway, I did end up there, as I'm sure you can expect from the way the story's going. <laughs> yeah. Let me check in for time quickly. We still doing all right? Uh, yeah, we're cool. Yeah. Okay. Because this, you know, this story can go in any many different directions. <laughs> um, one step before that, I was at um, a. I signed up to a, a transcendental meditation uh, retreat in Ubud in Bali and it was a five-day retreat in a place called um, Guy Retreat Center, a beautiful place and I went in there and there was no BS there apart from the people that are running it, it just so happened to be and um, I had a guy called Y and a wonderful um, transcendental meditation teacher who worked with me each day to teach me the art of transcendental meditation I turned my phone off for the first time in God knows how long, maybe 10 years for five days. And I sat and I learned this practice of meditation. And for me, it was like hard to close my eyes if I'm honest with you for more than like 30 seconds. It's like they just started wanting to fight to be open. I have such an active mind. I had insomnia for most of my like growing life, um, which was good in some ways because I did a lot of learning that time, but also a pretty challenging experience. Um, so, um, you know, meditation was not something that came easy to me, but I was up for sort of, it was in the right space to learn it. And, um, you know, it's a great practice because you have an affirmation and that gives you something to be with and that gives you a space to sort of work with. And what I found is that where I'd always been trying to go out of myself with my meditations, like as if I were to shoot out of my body into like some sort of galactic place or something, what I found was this is actually coming in. It was like, this was having me, it was actually, meditation was actually dropping into the body, into my body. I'd never really got that or experienced that before. And this helped me to, to do that, to do that. So it was awesome. So I was having a ex very expansive experience already. Um, and then I went to a place called the Pyramid of Chi in Bali, which is a sound, um, a sound therapy or sound healing or sound bath uh, place which is essentially like a big pyramid that they've built, especially for it. And um, you lie on these mats and they start to play extraordinary instruments that resonate in extraordinary ways. And I went in there thinking maybe it'd be relaxing or just good, like new sorts of listen to music. I was not expecting to have my first metaphysical experience or experience of um experience of of otherness i guess is the the best way to say it. it's just a feeling of connection to something of a knowing something opened and i felt it's like um and i felt like a a connection to vicky and a piece i had images come to me um that just were extremely pertinent and powerful. And I came out of that experience reborn from just sound. I literally was like, sort of just looking around, like, did that just really happen from sound? I was, I, I was blown away. I'm an explorer. I've been like do, trying to try, I've tried lots of different things, lots of different things I enjoy. I was, I'd never had an experience like it in terms of something that had taken me, actually broke down some of my paradigms in that moment, just through pure experience. So that happened. 
Um, and then I came back and that night I fell asleep and I woke up and I had this, this sort of hallelujah moment of uh, something dropping in. You know, again, I'm full of cliches today. You have to excuse me. But it's like light bulb moment. And um, this idea for something called Toledo dropped in um, and um, a bit about what it's, got, what it's got to be, the foundations for a harmonious life. That was the, the feeling, the image that just kept coming to me, foundations for a harmonious life and to um, create a, sort of an organism, really a, an infrastructure for uh, people to be able to do that and take themselves on their own path of self-realization was born in, in that moment, there and then. And then I went on from there, um, from Bali, then I went on to, the, um, to Australia, where this uh, plant medicine ceremony was happening. It was a, a cactus ceremony, Wachuma um, ceremony. Don't know if your listeners will be familiar with that or not. I certainly wasn't. Um, before I was invited to that particular one. Um, but again, it's, how much did I actually know? I think I knew sort of almost nothing about what it was before I went into it. But at this point I was just ready to take on the unknown. It's all I had been sharing anyway. Um, so I went to this place that it was held in with a lot of integrity and it was a beautiful ceremony. It was a, I had to move through some like real, real nausea in the beginning. Um, and then I like had a good, good old purge. Um, had a, yeah, I went necessarily, I was about to go into more de detail, but <laughs> yeah, I can't see you there for that moment. I know it's good, it's night time here, it's morning where you are, so. Um, and then just had an extraordinarily opening experience um, you know sometimes I wonder of the value of sharing these stories because everyone's if, if anyone ever ends up on one, in, in a journey of working with any kind of plant medicine number one it is to be respected as something to be held in a high degree of reverence and um, responsibility and to follow the proper sort of rituals and ceremonies, just held in the proper way. The proper, I don't even know if it's the right language, just held with a high degree of integrity. The people that understand that there's a lineage there or at least, you know, people that know how to work with medicine or connect to that medicine. I'm not here to sort of, um, endorse or not endorse. I'm just sharing, of course, my own experience. And I think there's something to be said for a calling. And it, you know, I think we each just need to feel into what our lives bringing us and say yes to, do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's, there's more than, uh, there's, uh, there's also more than one way to skin a cat. I mean, the part, like the path to awakening into our truths and into our higher selves is, there's myriad ways, Medita meditations, many, many ways. I've been kind of shocked into existence <laughs> in a hurry, um, but it's an extraordinary healing, powerful tool uh, and a powerful uh, experience. So I had a very opening experience. I, um, you know, I spent four hours looking, watching a hibiscus flower go through its opening, its journey of opening. And as I watched that journey, felt my own opening, my own heart happening at the same time. And understood the relationship between the masculine and feminine, the witness and the receiving. I, 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 I was experiencing it in its rawest form in that moment. And it just, it was kind of like, like all the constructs and concepts I've been working to build across my whole life, ever since I started first asking existential questions when I was like eight or nine, nine years old, I went through to my mum's bedroom. Where does the universe end, mum? Where does the universe end? Um, I don't know. Go, go to bed now. <laughs> what happens when you die? What happens when you die? Um, well, there's this idea of heaven. Oh, I don't know about that. I'm not buying that, mum. What else? It's like maybe, maybe we'll put a TV in your room. So, 
it's like all those questions I've been asking and all the constructs I've been building to get a picture, it's suddenly like it all came into one. And um, I had contextualized myself and my experience in a way that brought harmony and unity to it. And um, I had a divine experience. There's, that's what the experience was. Now you can, we, can, we can discuss it in many different ways, whether that was just what I was generating for myself, maybe, but it's just, I can only say what the experience was and that's what it felt like. And um, I'm always someone who's with the truth of my experience. And um, I just have continued to allow myself to listen uh, to um, what's there and just noticed that I am not on my own. I'm being supported. There's no two ways about it. And in fact, I feel like I was arrogant to think that I was trying to do it all, all by myself. We have a responsibility, the ability to respond, and we have to respond in truth, and that's hard enough. But the rest we're met with. And one of the things I was met with in that pursuit is an extraordinary human being by the name of Prue. And um, it was a very solitary experience in many ways, but just before we left, there was one person I wanted to grab and speak to just because I could feel a vibration and feel like she is someone that I would like to uh, get to know. And at this point, I was not thinking of that from a relationship perspective because I'd just come out of this thing, da da da, and I was like, I'm doing this solitary, solitary like time sort of thing. But she told me about um, the field she works in, and that she um, should say, you know, works in traditional Chinese medicine, and she was now help, helping people to better understand the experience of their feelings and their bodies and their heart, the language of their heart, basically reunite that with the mind. And it just struck a chord with me because it's like she had been learning the body side of the philosophy and I've been learning the mind side of the philosophy for a very long time. And then, so we just came together and we started jamming and sort of filling in the spaces for each other. And like before very long, I knew I was head over heels in love. She was in Australia, I was in the UK. And we'd been together for that one day. And um, yeah, I kind of persuaded her to meet up back up with me in Bali. Um, I sort of like half positioned it as an opportunity to talk about building the business or building, helping her build our business. But I think we both knew at this point that was not the intention. <laughs> I, said, I was like fully smitten. And um, then we got to Bali and I just had two of the most extraordinary magic field. Um, weeks of my entire life. It's like all of the magic I'd started to experience, the universe has been kind of revealing itself to me. And um, all of that just like went into a whole nother gear. And it was just like extraordinary, extraordinary levels of magic. And Prue just brought the next level in. Um, it was amazing, she was incredible. So, that led then to us, her coming back to the UK with me and um, us um, conceiving our first child. Yeah. Um, unexpectedly, but then when it happened, we both knew that we were with the people that we'd want to take this on. Even if this is sooner than we were expecting, there's no doubt in my mind that she was the person that I wanted to take that journey on with. So we both were ready to jump, jump straight in. Um, now I could go on to tell some other tales and, and other experiences if you want to speak into some of the specifics, but you know there's a long, there's many avenues to go down. So again, I just want to offer the opportunity to ask yeah. any questions or take it down any any variety, other roads. No, I think I think while you were talking about the whole Toledo experience, and obviously it was the breakup with your girlfriend that that sort of took you to Bali, if you like, in terms of wanting that space and time to yourself and and feel into what felt right in the moment and all of that great stuff. And I, ju I think I wanna share just how I've sort of become part of that because, you know, your Toledo, um, uh, what's, what's the word I'm looking for? Vision, dream, whatever, um, has, is now in, involving me. And basically, you know, 
we're talking about energy. I, I did ayahuasca and, and wachuma over 12 months ago. I had a different experience to you. I will, I will do it again at some point, but I think, um, you know, like you said, everybody's experience with that is different and it needs to be respected. And mine, mine just floored me. That's pretty much what it did. But that was what I needed, you know, to, to sort of chill me out, if you like. Um, and then since then, it's been, you know, I was made redundant. Um, the, the Toledo opportunity was presented to me at the same time I was made redundant, which is crazy. And, um, but it was like, it spoke to my heart's calling because I know that I wanted to go into some form of coaching or helping people um, for, for quite a few years. I mean, when I was at uni, I did psychology and social policy and, and I thought I was going to be a psychologist. And then when I finished uni, I thought, well, who's going to listen to a 23 year old girl with no life experience? So I ended up in sales um, and ended up staying there for far too long. But um, yeah, I just wanted to express that, you know, for the listeners really, because Alex was on this almost eat, pray, love journey. Um, have you seen that film, by the way? Yeah, wonderful film. Um, and obviously a true story. And, but that, that has then impacted me in as much as I am now on my, feel like I'm on my purpose driven journey for the first time ever, really. You know, a bit like yourself, I, um, I was chasing the money and all the rest of it. In my younger days, I was, you know, I was in a rock pop band, thought we were gonna make it big, we never did and all that. And it, and it was all about the, I mean, people used to say to me, oh, you just want to be famous. And I was like, no, it's not that. I, I want to get paid very well for what I like, you know, for what I enjoy doing. But there probably was an element of the fame thing. Thank God we didn't um, get famous because I just don't think it would have worked for me. But, um, but yeah, so, you know, I've been on a similar journey to you in terms of in your 20s, it's, you know, and then in your 30s, you start to, I don't know, change a little bit and then maybe marriages come and go and all that sort of stuff. And then here I am on the back of your amazing experience in Bali and meeting the wonderful crew, now embarking on my purpose driven journey. And, um, you know, having met or started a, a wonderful relationship myself this year with a friend of 23 years. And I, and I think who we were in a band together, you know, we were in that band and um, it, it's mad. And I think my ayahuasca journey has opened me up. I didn't sit and watch a hibiscus flower for four hours. Um, but I, I totally get what you're saying. Um, well, that was that was the tumor as opposed to ayahuasca. That was the ayahuasca the tumor, sorry, yeah. And it was a diff very, very different experience, probably even more akin to, to yours. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I just think, you know, because we all know, you know, it's like the the butterfly effect, you know, they say the flapping of a butterfly's wings in one continent can create you know, a storm or a tornado in another continent or whatever. And it's really hard to imagine how that's even possible. But when you look at how, you know, we're all connected, which I fully, fully believe, um, and we're all energy and we're all vibration, you know, we're all energy vibrating at whatever frequency we're vibrating at. The impact of you in Bali has, has you know, has led me to where I am today. So um, I'd like to say thank you for that. Not that you knew that that was happening at the time, but you know, it kind of, it, it's kind of, it just has happened. And yeah, it's just amazing. So um, thank you. Well, if we use your analogy there, or not, I'm not, maybe it's more, if we use your terminology there in terms of the energy and frequency, Perhaps the work I was doing there might have broadcasted a particular frequency, but you've done the work yourself to come and tune in. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You've got a lot of credit to give yourself. Um, well, we are an hour in. Is there anything, how I normally like to um, sort of finish off is for our listeners, you know, is there anything, if there was somebody sat here listening, thinking, I'm not happy with my life, I really have no idea how to change things, I think I'm destined for greater things, I just don't know what it is. Is there any sort of words of wisdom or anything that you could say to that? Yes, 
Um, firstly, I feel like maybe, I hope I haven't been dismissive of the listeners too much because we've been engrossed in this conversation. Um, but I wanted to say, if you have listened to this way, thank you so much for being here. I mean, even the fact that you're here listening to, now listening to these conversations, that means that you're already asking yourself the right questions, opening yourself in the right ways. Um, what I would suggest is that step one would be to listen. I'd say listening is something that we need to do more of. We know intuitively. We, we can hear, we need to, right now, all of us are experiencing a lot of our fears coming up. A lot of us are experiencing, um, there's just a lot of unknown. There's a lot of chaos to face, you know, there's a lot of just unknown. And in the unknown, we project the things that we're afraid that might come out of that unknown. So it's like a blank canvas. And the more um, difficulty we have in pre predicting that, that canvas, so when something like coronavirus comes up, where it seems like it drops and changes a lot and it's so new and we don't know necessarily what it's gonna mean or what it's gonna do, it can create a lot of space and a lot of blankness on the canvas for us to project um, our fears into. So what I recommend is that we do our best to come back into the present moment. Remember that everything that happens is happening for us, even when it doesn't feel that way, it can feel like it really isn't. And come back into taking as much personal responsibility as we possibly can for ourselves. As much responsibility as we can for how we respond to the world as it comes at us. That is our responsibility. It's our ability to respond. That our vibration, our frequency, our life is determined by moments and how we respond to those moments. We get very caught up in the, the big pictures and the things in the future. And we forget to pay attention to how we're actually showing up in our lives. And that is what dictates, dictates the path of them. We get very concerned about what we believe in our minds and we think that our thoughts are what we believe but it's not it's what we act out that's what we believe that's that's our belief is what we act into the world so we should pay as much attention as we can to who we're showing up as and how we're showing up and if that feels our integrity of who we choose to be who we feel called to be which is why you're doing such powerful work because what you're doing and why i'm so grateful to have you in some of your experience and heart and wisdom as part of this mission is you're helping people to have those structures to orientate themselves through to know when something comes at you your you know your friend rises up you get triggered like any of those moments we have to respond to life or we have a decision to make that feels like there's a lot of factors we need a struct we need structures to be able to orientate ourselves freely we can trust especially when we can't trust the structures that are outside of ourselves like it's difficult at the moment the organizations we don't know who to trust anymore we don't know whether we can trust our social media we don't know if we can trust our internet providers we don't know if we can trust our politicians we don't know who we can trust structurally outside of ourselves we don't know if we can trust our doctors we don't know if they're we don't know who we can trust outside of ourselves so we have to know how to trust ourselves and have reliable structures to be able to operate through in the world so that we can navigate through the chaos of our experience towards more harmonious versions of ourselves and we can enjoy our lives and feel purposeful and meaningful. And your values, your vision, your mission, the, the infrastructure that you help people discover within themselves, I know of no other vehicle. I know of no other way that you can it, um, build something that's based on your own intrinsic truths that will help you navigate any unknown, any towards something which brings you closer to being at integrity with who you're called to be than um, the work that you're doing. So thank you for bringing that work into the world. I mean it um, because you're helping people awaken to their truths and to get rid of suffering, not pain. Pain is going to be there. Pain is part of the journey. But suffering is not needed. We can, suffering is meaningless pain and it's, it is, there is none. It's a mistake. We can, once we find our meaning and our truth and we're orientated properly, we know that our discomforts are orientated towards meaning. Okay. Thank you, Alex. Um, it's been wonderful to spend this last hour with you.
Um, if people want to find out a little bit more about you, what would be the best place for them to find you? Um, the best place for them to find me would be, uh, there's my uh, website, alexandereastman.com. Well, actually, do you know what? You can, my Instagram is where I'm actually most um, active at the moment, which okay. is at Alexander Eastman. So it's just Z-A-N-D-E-R-E-A-S-T-M-A-N. And that's where I'm sort of sharing if anyone's interested to come along. Always nice to um, hear from new people. But I'd say more importantly, uh, make sure you're getting involved in checking out Ultimate oh, Contribution Uncovered, what you're involved in, Toledo, the bigger picture of that, which is way bigger than me. Um, I'm just there to share aspects of the vision. I've got an extraordinary community of individuals that we're all building this together. And it's a movement of self-realization. It's um, very exciting to be a part of. And um, I'm just holding on to the seat of my pants, basically, at the moment. And just on an extraordinary ride um, of what seems to be a very meaningful uh, pursuit with a lot of extraordinary human beings uh, part of it. And you are one of them. So thank you very much. I am. No, thank you. All right, that's brilliant. Thank you, Alex. It's been wonderful. And um, I bet you're ready for your bed now. So uh, thank, you very much. <laughs> thank you very much. You are most welcome. Thank you.